So for the past four months, I've had subscriptions to both Cursor and Windsurf. And in this video, I'm going to be showing you which one I'd actually keep and why. So in this video, I'm going to be showing you a real life experience of what it's like to code with AI using Cursor and Windsurf. And I'm going to be telling you everything around the pricing, how to work with the AI. Okay, so let's start with the pricing because this is where people get the most confused. So Cursor starts at $20 a month. That gives you unlimited tab completions, which sounds awesome. But here's the tricky part. They charge you by something that's called a token count. Now, if you're new to AI tools, a token count is basically a chunk of text that you send to the AI and you receive from the model. And every line of your repo, every message, every output counts towards that token output. And once you hit your limit, you have to buy more tokens or you pay as you go. So something like Cursor charges you tokens and you pay as you go if you go over their limit. So smarter models like Claude 4.0 burn through those tokens much faster and they cost much more. On the other hand, Windsurf costs $15 a month and they charge you per prompts. So they give you 500 prompts per month and you can purchase more prompts using $10 a month and they'll give you 250 prompts. So Windsurf has their own proprietary models that you can use and like Cursor, smarter models cost more per interaction. So both have extra add-ons, but once you start using either, honestly, it's much easier to be addicted to start prompting the LLM to do all your work for you. And it's a little sad, but it's also exciting. So what used to take you know hours and hours to implement a feature, you can just ask the AI and it'll implement it for you in a matter of minutes. And I used to love the art of coding, but it gives you the benefit of creating code and creating features much faster and you're able to see the results of your features. So performance wise, I saw Cursor to be much more performant. I'm not really sure on how everything is handled on their back end. It might be that it's pulling more context or that it does a better job at picking the right pieces of code to send to the model. But it seemed like it was a lot easier for me to interact with Cursor because it do basically what I wanted it to do. The downside is it's pretty expensive. So Cursor sometimes does an extra automatic reasoning that sometimes I don't see. So it's hard to keep a limit on how many tokens that the, the model is using. Meanwhile, Windsurf, it just seems much more conservative because it's on a prompt based payment. So it seems like it cuts prompts short just to save on those tokens. So one of the things that you can also do to game the system of Windsurf because it's using prompts is that whenever it's trying to do a command for you, you can actually run an echo command, which you can change the command that the AI is running to do an echo. So you're pretty much piggybacking on a previous prompt that you told it. And I'll admit, I don't do much coding now that I have access to the chat interface. So even sometimes when things that might take me just as long to code everything out, I would just ask the AI to code it up for me just because I'm, I'm that lazy. And another useful thing is that when you're asking the AI to do all of these small things, it still has that context into what you wanted it to focus on. So it knows your code changes. And I'll just give you a quick tip. Model that I used the most was Claude 4.0. And there was a moment where I switched to a cheaper model, which was Claude 3.7. And it took me hours to implement a fix for a feature that I was working on. And then I quickly changed the model that I had set and I put it to Claude 4.0 and it got the feature fixed in a matter of just one single prompt. So now I'm gonna share with you five easy tips to implement so you don't spend hours struggling to code with AI. So tip number one, use context efficiently. When you start a new feature, you want to be wary about the context that the AI has access to. If for some reason you're coding with the AI and it produces an error for you, you don't wanna keep the same context for too long or else it'll get used to generating the same errors over and over and over again. 
So it might be more cost efficient for you to open up a new tab, a new conversation, start a new context and explain the, everything that's been going on and for it to fix or implement any feature that you want it to do. So tip number two is to force it to test the code before it says that the feature is implemented. So you can't just randomly trust the AI when it says, I you know I absolutely fixed the code, I implemented the feature that you want and it's completely fixed. There's gonna be many times when the AI says that, but you can't really trust it. So what I do is I'll tell the AI to look at the logic it just implemented, create a little test file on the side and run the same parameters or run the same data through that, that same logic to see if it's actually performing correctly. That way the AI has some context into what's actually going on and then it can use that test as a debugging script and it can implement the fix in your main code when it is fixed or when it is working. All right, so tip number three is to understand what you're building. So I know you might be prompted to just give the AI you know, a high level prompt to implement a complex feature in your project, but that might be a mistake. And the reason being is that when you give a very high level command, there you are giving the AI to make a bunch of decisions that might not be desirable for what you want to be building. And when you are being very precise, you yourself as a developer has have some idea on how certain features work. And when you go to ask for another feature, you know that you can prompt that new feature to act cohesively with the other features that the AI implemented. So that gives you more control on what's going on in the project and then you can manipulate it in a way that fits the requirements that you know. And then the fourth tip for this video is to ask the AI to generate readme files. So as you're prompting the model, there are you know certain decisions that the AI might make that might not align with what you desire. So a good way to get the AI to provide some details on what it was, what it's actually doing is to produce some documentation for you. And that way, when you go to look at the project, instead of inspecting the code, you can look at this documentation file to see everything that, that the AI is doing. And when you're telling the AI to produce this documentation file, you need to tell it to be very specific on what it's doing. There are many cases where I told it to produce some documentation for me and then it glazed over some of the details and it went unnoticed until I actually looked at the code. So having that documentation file, it saves you time because you can always come back to the project and then you can come back to that readme file, you know exactly what's going on and two, you understand what is going on in your project. And tip number five, this might not apply to everyone and it certainly is maybe a more advanced thing to do, but you can also code in parallel. So this isn't a, this is a new concept many developers probably don't do because coding really takes a lot of focus on, you know, looking at a single project. But now with the tools of AI, you can actually speed up the efficiency of how you're coding. So if you have an idea of multiple features that you want to build, but you're not actually sure on you know all the logistics of how it's going to look, you can actually open up multiple cursor windows or curse, um, windsurf windows, and you can prompt the, the LLM in multiple windows. So this allows you to create prototypes very quickly. And once you have certain features, um, created and all the bugs sorted out, you can synthesize the features from multiple files into a single project. And at the end of the day, both AI tools are very powerful. They can speed up the efficiency for you as a programmer. You can implement systems and features very quickly. But honestly, the best advice that I can give everyone is to try coding without AI first. I mean, seriously, just build a website or anything from scratch understand all the difficulties all the bugs that you might come across you know things that you might break you know that's how you learn how the system works once you get over the first project you can come back to ai tools like cursor and windsurf and you'll know how to use them correctly 
So these tools shouldn't be used to replace your creativity. They should be used to amplify things that you're already doing. Stop thinking like a coder and start thinking like an architect. And that's how you grow. So which one would I choose? Honestly, I'm gonna have to keep both. The reason why I have both is because when I'm using cursor, I'm, there are points when I use up all the credits and then I have Windsurf and then I'll you know use all, all the credits there. And whenever I run out of credits with Windsurf, I can use their cheaper payment model to buy 250 prompts with just $10, which is a lot cheaper than using Cursor. So if this video helped you out, please leave a like, hit that notification button, and let me know in the comments which one you prefer. Are you team Cursor or are you, are you team Windsurf? Uh, let me know in the comments down below. And don't forget to hit subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.